my name is Sandy. Um, I thank you so much for coming today. Um, for some of us, not just the speakers, but for some of us, it was a step of faith to come today. It takes a little bit of courage and a little bit of overcoming certain things inside of us to walk through the doors whenever there's a gathering like this. But believe you me, you are called to be here by God himself. And, and if you are here, then you have answered a call from the Lord himself. And I just think that's fantastic. So thank you so much for being here. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. Lord, I ask you to be with each and every lady who is here. Lord, I ask that our hearts be open. Lord, that they be open to your calling and to your word. And Lord, I pray that you move each person in this place. And Lord, I pray that you will plant seeds that will grow deep roots. And Lord, that as we go through our days and our weeks and our months to come, Lord, that what you have for us in the next three hours will just continually renew who you are in our lives. So Lord, we just ask you to be with us, that your Holy Spirit would just snuggle up, and Lord, that we would be ready to hear what you have to say. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, so... My study for this, because um, I had to try to find something that would make sense to me reading through biblical stories, and at first I thought, well, I'm going to try to find something like Ruth and Naomi or, you know, something female-oriented since this is a women's conference, but that sort of failed. So what I um, decided to, or actually what the Lord gave to me, it really wasn't up to me, um, was 1 Samuel 8 through 2 Samuel 9. It's a huge text. And, I mean, you can turn to it if you want, but I'm certainly not going to read, you know, the, all, those, all that stuff to you. But basically... What we're going to focus on today is David, okay? And I think the reason that David is where the heart of this friendship lecture is is because he was called a man after God's own heart. And I know that I want to be a woman after God's own heart. And I want to give you something that will help you to be women after God's own heart. And so David is going to be the focus of what I talk about today. Um, so David um, was from the tribe of Judah. He was anointed when he was 30 years old. And I'm sorry, he became king when he was 30 years old, and he was king for about 40 years. Um, now, at the time that this passage, the 1 Samuel 8 through 2 Samuel 9, at that time, the king who was in place was King Saul. Now, there's a couple of subtle differences between David and Saul that I want to kind of talk about up front, because they're going to be two of three focal characters throughout at least this first part um, of what, I'm, what I have to say. So, um, King Saul... Um, just to give you a little bit of background, he was put in to place because Samuel, the prophet, um, he was getting older in years. He had set up his two sons to start doing, taking over and doing what, what he was doing in his adult age. Well, they were totally not doing it. They were corrupt. They were taking bribes. They were doing things that they shouldn't be doing. The elders of Israel came along and they said, Samuel, you're getting old. You're about out of here. Your sons are not towing the line. So we want a king. And Samuel said, well, that's, that's not the plan. That's not what we're supposed to be doing here, but I'll, I'll go pray and I'll talk to God. Well, God said, well, it's not you they're rejecting really. It's that they don't want to be under my authority anymore. They want to be under the authority of man. So we're going to give them a king. So Saul was put into place by the people's appointment, if you want to call it that. But God did anoint him into that position. David, on the other hand, he was both appointed and anointed by God. That was his true chosen king. Okay, So those that subtle difference is, I believe, one of the reasons that the results from each of their time um, reigning over Israel had different results. So just keep in mind that where your heart is when you begin something um, helps to dictate the fruit of the something that you are trying to do, okay? So, so these, these few chapters, basically what happened, it's just the story of David and Saul and then Saul's son, Jonathan. Okay, so very, very briefly, I'm just going to run through the story so you have some background. So, um, basically, 
my notes are backwards. <laughs> All right, so Saul was pretty faithful to his position. He was doing what he needed to be doing. The Philistines were the main threat at the time. He was organizing and, and going out into battle, and he was doing what he needed to do um, for the people of Israel. Um, however, he knew that his time was short. And the reason he knew his kingship was short, because he had done, at least of what was recorded in scripture, at least two big, huge no-nos. Um, one of the things that he did, um, some of you may be familiar with it, um, he, uh, so, so basically they were, they were out and they were, the, he and his troops were out and they got surrounded by this huge, huge um, troop of Philistines. I mean, huge, a lot, a lot, a lot of Philistines. And so, you know, David's crew was like, whoa, this is so bad. <laughs> like, like we should get out of here. We, we shouldn't be here. We got to go. And, and so they were freaking out. Some people were trying to leave. I mean, it was, it was just craziness. And so Saul was like, well, okay, we got, we need to do something. I need to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. I need to do something. I need to do something. But Samuel, who was the appropriate person to do that, was not there. So Saul waited. He waited for seven days, and I'm sure he was being pressured. I'm sure that he was watching people freak out, and so he was under a lot of stress. Um, but Saul didn't come, and so finally he said, okay, whatever. And so then he took it upon himself as King Saul to bring in those sacrifices and offer them to the Lord. Well, right after he had done that, here comes um, Samuel, and he says, what have you done? And he said, well, you know, we're, we're in a pickle. And, and, you know, Samuel says, it is not your place and the Lord will remove your kingdom because you've done this. So that was, so through Samuel, the Lord actually told him, this is not going to last. The second thing that happened was um, whenever uh, God through Samuel told uh, Saul to destroy Amalek, all right? completely destroy everything, everyone, animals, everything. Nobody survives the, the attack. Well, Saul went in, he did destroy everyone except the king, King Agag, and he also kept back all the best of everything that, that was there to be offered. Animals, uh, you know, gold and silver, blah, blah, right? Kept the best of everything. Well, here comes Samuel, and he said, so how's it going? And he said, well, I did what I was supposed to do. I wiped out Amalek. Meanwhile, Samuel says, well, why do I hear bleeding sheep behind you? Why are there living animals behind you, if that's the case? And he said, oh, well, well, I went in and destroyed, but my people, you know, they kept, I mean, you know, he pulled what we all pulled. Well, you know, it really wasn't me. It was more like them, you know, like, you know, what am I going to do? There's a lot of people to, you know, govern. And, um, and Samuel said, the Lord is the Lord, and he anointed you, and he gave you a directive. Why didn't you follow it? And so then Saul says, okay, you're right. I have transgressed. This is bad. I shouldn't have done that. Come with me. And Samuel says, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not going with you because you have, um, you have done something that you can't get past. And if, if you did turn to First uh, Samuel, if you want to go to 1526, this was what he said in response to um, that second offense. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. So Saul knew. Saul knew that his time was short. Well, <coughs> while this is happening, David ends up being anointed. He was not king yet, but he was anointed by the Lord through, Sam through Samuel. Um, well, David, um, his father asked, okay, so David had several older brothers. The three oldest were in the army fighting the Philistines. His dad, Samuel's dad, uh, not Samuel, who are we talking about? David's dad. You guys are listening. Good job. Good job. David's dad says, go up and check on my boys, take some food, you know, schmooze over with their commanders, do your thing, and find out how, the, how everything's going. Well, so he goes up, he takes the food, and, and what has happened is, again, they're fighting the Philistines, and they've come to this agreement. One Philistine goes out and fights one Israeli and winner take all, basically, right? Well, the, the um, Philistine was Goliath, and he was huge. And again, terror was just going through all of the troops. They were like, who is going to go fight that dude? Like, <laughs> who's going to sign up for that? And so, and, and so David is kind of, you know, he's checking on his brothers, and David says, well, what's the problem? So they say, well, you know, it's... Goliath, you know, what are we going to do? And David said, who is that? Who is this compared to our God 
There is no one who can, who can defeat our God. And so he's confused. He goes and anyway, he ends up volunteering. He puts his money where his mouth is. He goes out. Oh, and what's amazing, what's amazing is in this, in this thing, he walks out and he doesn't say, I'm going to beat you. He says, you will be defeated because my God is greater than you. And my God is greater than your God. And one stone throw later and Goliath is out. Well, this puts David officially on the radar, all right? Um, Saul has noticed him. He says, oh my goodness, this is fantastic. Come back, live with me. I want you to stay with me. He meets Jonathan when he goes back. Um, to Saul's house. Well, he and Jonathan immediately hit it off. Um, they are very, very, very close friends. As a matter of fact, Jonathan describes their relationship as, I loved him as I loved my own soul. So they were very, very close. All right. Um, let's see. Okay, so David is, like I said, he's on the map. And word, so he's living with Saul, living his life, being awesome. And the rest of the communities, as the word spreads about what happened with Goliath, the people are beginning to find out who David is, right? And so the song comes up, the song, where people were singing, David, uh, sorry, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands, right? Sort of elevating David. Well, Saul eventually finds out about this, and it causes him great distress. He begins to form quite a bit of resentment against David, and it just starts this entire process between he and David. All right. Well, one, so remember, David's living with Saul. He finds out what's happening. So Saul actually tries to kill him twice while he's at, at his house, and David gets away. And, and in Scripture, it says that David realized the reason that he didn't kill, uh, sorry, Saul realizes that the reason he didn't kill David was because the Lord didn't allow it. I mean, he already knew. Saul is completely aware of what's happening, right? But unfortunately, this is what happens with us, ladies, that that bit of pride that was touched by that song, it, be, it he allowed that to sit in his heart, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it formed deep roots. And, and he tried, I mean, he tried several times throughout this, this passage. He tried, oh yeah, you're right, I shouldn't be going after David. Right back after him. Oh yeah, you're right, I shouldn't be going after David. Right back after him. You know, he, is, he was not capable of killing that root of bitterness on his own. So something to be aware of and to keep in the back of your mind. Um, so, um, so Saul tried to kill him a couple times and, and it didn't work out. Well, so then he, he took an indirect route in trying to kill him. This is what we do. I mean, this is totally human. This is what we do. Couldn't get at it head on, so now we're going to try a different way. We're going to try a different tact. So what he does is he says, okay, I'm going to offer my daughter for marriage, hoping that she will distract him, she will distress him, she will upset him, she will cause him to go off balance. And I'm also going to send him out into battle. And that way, I don't have to deal with him, the Philistines will deal with him for me, right? That was his plan. But what he says to David, I want you to marry my daughter. Come on in, I want you to marry my daughter, but I still want you to keep fighting. You, you have to keep fighting, you can't get married and then stay home. And David's response, oh no, no, no. Who am I to be the king's son-in-law? Who am I to, to be related to the king? And so he, he refused and said no. Well, then Saul finds out, this is intriguing. Saul finds out, it's like high school, you guys, seriously. Saul finds out that another daughter is truly in love with David, all right? And so he's like, bingo, I don't even have to manipulate it, I'll just put her you know, I'll just, I'll just put her in, right? So then he, uh, so, but, and he also knows, he realizes, I can't go to David directly and say, marry my daughter. I already tried that. It failed. So now I have to have another way. Enter high school. He sends his little cronies, his spies, his servants, sends them out and says, go tell David to marry my daughter. And so they're like, okay, okay. So they go, David, dude, you should totally marry her. You're, you should totally marry her. She is so into you. And David says, no. I am not worthy 
to be the king's son-in-law. I am not worthy, and I won't do it. So they head back, and they're like, no, you're not going to do it. He's not worthy, you know, whatever. And uh, Saul says, ugh. All right, tell him, go back and tell him, if he will continue to kill Philistines for me, he can earn his worth. A hundred Philistines. If he can prove to me he's killed a hundred Philistines, he's worthy. Just tell, tell him that. He says, all you have to do is kill Philistines and you can do it. And David's like, oh, snap, cool, that's what I'm going to do. So David goes and kills 200 Philistines and brings back proof of 200 and gives it to the king and then marries his daughter. Well, at the end of all this, you'll note that David is happily married and the Philistines didn't kill him. So really all Saul managed to do was bring him into his family, officially, <laughs> you know, which I think is hilarious. So anyway, so the, indi the indirect approach did not work. It didn't work. So that's fine. So now he's angry and he, that root has really grown deep. He's angry now. And so now he doesn't care. He's telling his servants, he's even telling his son, Jonathan, I'm going to kill him. He is gone. Well, Jonathan basically talks him out of it. He's like, remember Goliath? Remember the things he's done? He used to play the harp for him when that distressed spirit would come and, and, and uh, cause him all this stress. And, you know, remember all those things? He's David. Don't, don't do that. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I shouldn't kill him. You're right. So he's, he decides not to do it. Um, so... Eventually, he tried again. And this time when, he, when Saul made the decision, he would not be talked out of it. He would not be, there was nothing that anyone was going to say or do to cause him to take it back. So, um, David was actually in playing the harp for him. He was, had the distressed spirit on him, which does not help when you're angry. <laughs> so the guy is irritated on top of, you know, this bitterness. So David's playing, and he throws a spear at him, misses him, you know, pales the wall, whatever, and David's like, wow. So David goes and finds Jonathan, and he says, your dad's trying to kill me again. What is up with this? Like, what are we going to do? And, and, and uh, Jonathan says, oh, don't worry about it. I'll go. He tells me everything. I'll know. And he says, no, it happened the last time. He knows you're telling me. He's not going to tell you again. Again, we're a little bit in high school. And, um, and so, uh, you know, Jonathan says, well, you know, what do you want me to do? Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. What do you want me to do? If I can't do it the way I know, what do you want me to do? He says, okay, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to go hide. And we're going to make up a signal. And one signal means, yes, it's okay to re-enter the city. And the other one is, no, it's not okay. You're going to have to book it on out, right? So they figure all this out and how they're going to talk to each other. And then David goes and hides. And Saul goes into the castle. A couple days later, it comes up. Where's David? I don't know. Saul, where's David? Where is he? I'm wondering. You know, and Saul, uh, sorry, Jonathan is saying, um, well, he asked if he could go to Bethlehem for, you know, and I said, yeah, I said, that was fine. Well, Saul was enraged immediately and calls his son a terrible thing. You can look it up yourself. <laughs> calls his son something awful. And then, um, and, and so Jonathan says, what is wrong? Why, why are you trying to kill him? What has he done? Well, the response to that was Saul actually tried to kill Jonathan at that point. He actually tried to kill him. It just didn't, it just didn't happen. So Jonathan, heavy heart, head down, drags his feet outside, gives the signal that, you know, we're done. And as soon as they have some time by themselves, Jonathan and David, and remember, these two men loved one another. They were very close. And Jonathan said, he, he is going, he is going to come after you. And David said, well, I, you know, I got to go. Um, and so Jonathan said, make a vow with me that you will continue. Part of the vow was, was honoring Jonathan, but the second part of the vow was, even after my death, continue to honor my family. Okay? Because this war between um, Saul and David could end up, in these times, just remember, if a new king took over many times, people who represented that new authority would go find the remnants of the old authority, especially the family, and take them all out so that there was no threat to the throne, right? So I'm sure that there was some of that thrown in there. That's conjecture. It's not in the scriptures that it says that, I'm, I'm assuming. So anyway, so they are very upset. Um, uh, 
Jonathan is distraught. They're crying. Um, they're sad that they're going to have to depart from one another. David, it says, was even more upset than Jonathan was, but it happened and they departed. All right, well, so then Saul continues to chase um, David and he, he just continues and continues and continues and continues. From time to time, he takes a break and goes after the Philistines, but he just keeps continuing and, and just keeps, David is just in his mind all the time. Well, on two occasions, David had an opportunity to kill Saul. Um, some of you may know the story. Saul went into a cave in En Gedi. He was relieving himself, and all and David and his whole garrison were behind him inside the depths of the cave. So his garrison was like, "Whoa, dude, go get him right now! Go do it now!" He totally doesn't know we're here. He's vulnerable. He's not expecting anyone to come up from behind him. Go get him now. And David said, oh, no, no, no. I will not kill the one that the Lord has anointed. I will not kill the anointed one of the Lord. But he does go up behind him and he cuts a piece of his robe off. The second time, um, the camp, they're, they're encamped and Saul is asleep. David comes into the camp, takes his spear and a water jug that was right next to his head, takes it out of camp, and to prove that he was there. On both occasions, Saul made it known, Saul, I keep doing that, David, David made it known to Saul that I was behind you and I was in the position to kill you, but I did not. And the reason I didn't, did it, did not, is because you are anointed of the Lord. I will not kill the Lord's anointed. He was very clear with them. Both times it caused Saul to go, Ugh, okay, fine, and then, you know, left him alone. So, so David and Saul have a very complicated uh, relationship with one another. Um, unfortunately, they had very little time with one another before Goliath um, to enjoy one another. It just kind of started with Goliath and just went downhill. Well, eventually Saul and Jonathan are on a campaign together at Count, Count, <laughs> Mount Gilboa, and they are both killed as a result or they both died as a result of that conflict. When David found out about those two having died, he was beside himself. He was so upset. And he has this um, lament that he goes And it is, um, it's, it's actually, if you, if you have the time or the inclination to take this story for what it is like have put yourself into David's position he loved Jonathan and think he loved Jonathan which means that he got to know the king through Jonathan now Saul, uh, David was very loyal he he did what the king wanted him to do even before he knew him because that's your job like, you are a citizen, I am the king, please do, you know, whatever. And so he did what he needed to do because that was his job. He was playing the harp and doing this. But then he was brought into his household, and I would imagine, again, conjecture, but I would imagine that all that time he spent with Jonathan, loving Jonathan and getting to know Jonathan, that he also got to know his dad, and he got to love his dad through Jonathan. And he, got, he built a relationship, even if it wasn't direct, he built a relationship caring for Saul, right? So now they're both gone. And David is very upset. And even though Saul had been pursuing him all, these all this time with, you know, this sort of vehement hatred, or whatever you want to call it, um, David still lamented for him. He said, oh my goodness, how the mighty have fallen. And he talks about Saul. And then at the end, he talks about how he is going to miss Jonathan so much. So it's an amazing passage. And if you go into it with that heart, it will make you cry. It'll make you tear up. It's really powerful. So anyway, so that is the story. That's the background for what I want to talk to you about today. So uh, how does all of this story, how does this apply to friendships? How am I going to wrap, wrap it up and put a bow on it, right? All right, so I need some help just very briefly. I need you just to yell out to me or gently call out to me. Uh, <laughs> um, what are some characteristics of a friend? If you were, are looking for a friend, just name simple characteristics that you're looking for. Loyalty. Loyalty. Trust. Trust. Okay. Honesty. What was that other one? Honesty and what? Understanding. Understanding. Okay. Sorry. I thought it came from here. Sorry. 
kindness, supportive, love. Okay, all right, perfect. Okay, so I have to tell you what I did. I went to Google, because he and I are friends. Went to Google, <laughs> and that's, that's the question I put in. I said, what are the characteristics of a friend? That's, that's the question I put in. And I, and I very first website that came up, didn't even look at it, very first website, clicked it, and basically what they said was, they accept you as you are, they're dependable, they're honest, they listen, they're supportive, they don't gossip about you, they're giving, and they're willing and wanting to spend time with you. Those were the characteristics of a friend, right? All right, so then I have another question for you. Now, and they may be the same, but what are some characteristics of a godly friend? When you're looking for a godly friend, what are those characteristics? Are they the same or does anything else come out that? Grace. Grace. God first. What did you say? Huh? Loving. Oh, loving. Okay. I'm sorry. Who else? Prayerful. Prayerful. Ooh, that was a good one. Prayerful. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Honestly. 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 Say again. Share conversations about the Lord. Perfect. So, again, Mr. Google and I, I just went into the same question and put the word godly in. Hit, hit, go. And first website that came up, this is what it said. They share the hope of the gospel with each other. They have realistic expectations, realizing that each are sinners. They're forgivers. They treat you as a family because you're brothers and sisters in Christ. They're trustworthy, so they're not a gossip. They're generous with their time and their money and their possessions because they know everything they own belongs to God anyway. Amen. They're encouraging. They help you keep your walk with God going. They're loving. They're peaceful. They always extend an olive branch or they seek forgiveness. They have a heart of service and they don't use you to meet their needs, but they want to serve to meet your needs. And they gently admonish whenever you start going off track. So they overlap, but there's some, there's some specifics for a godly friendship, right? So now let's go back to what we learned about David and Jonathan. We have this idea of what friends are, what godly friends are sort of swirling around in the ether up here. So now let's go back and talk about Jonathan and Saul, okay? Jonathan, Saul's son, Jonathan loved David initially because of what David did with Goliath and how he helped his father and how he helped his country, right? He, he loved him for, for who he was and what he was willing to do. And then it just grew from there and it became what it was. David, now this is, all of this is conjecture. This is not scriptural. This is, this is me talking. David loved Jonathan because Jonathan loved him. Jonathan came into a stranger's household and was overwhelmed with, I would imagine, with what he was having to deal with and what was happening to him. All this sudden, everyone knows my name, you know, whatever. And then here's Jonathan, and just a rock for him, and stability, and all of these things tied up, right? So Jonathan was all of these things to David, and David responded in kind and was all of those things to Jonathan. And they loved one another as they loved their own soul, right? Well, that is real. Oh, and by the way, David kept his promise. And even after Jonathan died, he had a son and he brought him in to live with him for the rest of his life. It's an amazing story. So anyway, you should, you should get after that. If I had more time, I'd tell you, but I, I'm going to run out of time. So, so, um, so anyway, this friendship between David and Jonathan, it's basically a no brainer, right? Like how easy is it to be, to embrace somebody who embraces you. It's just like Pastor Khan is always saying, when someone comes in the door, say hi, be nice, embrace them. Let them know that they're welcome here. Love them and they will love you and they will see the love of God through you, right? That is exactly what happened with Jonathan and Saul. And it was easy and it was awesome and, and, and it was real and it was genuine, right? Well, that's easy. We can all do that. That's the sort of friendship we're all looking for. Those are the things we want, right? But now I want to focus the rest of the time on David's friendship. You can air quote that if you want. David's friendship with Saul, okay? Now, 
it was complicated to say the least. It was very stressful. It was a stressful relationship. Um, so David's perspective, whenever he first came into contact with Saul, which was before, I think, before Goliath, when he was ministering to him with music, his response to Saul was, I am your servant. I am here to serve you. He had a servant's heart, but he was also in the presence of a king. Again, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? You do what you, that's what you do. But I think, especially since what I had spoken about earlier, his relationship with Jonathan, I think that truly grew. I don't know that it did, but I think it's very reasonable to assume that that relationship for, with Saul grew, even though I'm not sure that Saul and David had a lot of time together. I don't know that they spent time together the way that Jonathan and David did, but I think that it went from obligation and duty to honest, genuine love, right? He, he really cared for him. Um, David's perspective, I mean, I'm sorry, Saul's perspective was a little bit different. He was in a position of authority. And while I think he appreciated David whenever he used his music to calm spirits and make him feel better, and he appreciated David for his help with Goliath, and he appreciated David with all of the help that he, I mean, all the Philistines that he helped to wipe out, I think part of that he did have a love for him, but it was a working relationship more than a friendship for, for Saul. And, and part of that's circumstantial, but part of that is Saul's heart too, okay? So, I have, a, I have another question. You don't have to answer this one, though. You can just think about it. All right. Do you think, is it possible that David was tempted, like really seriously tempted, to kill Saul, those two opportunities that he had, especially that first one? Do you think he was tempted at all? Yeah, some people say no, other people are going, yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't know what the answer is. I don't, I don't know the answer. It's not in the scripture, so I don't know. But I can imagine that someone who's pursuing me and trying to kill me and over and over drove me out of my home relentlessly after me, and then, and on top of that, behind me, I have all the men I trust all the men I care for, all the men who have my back are saying, kill him, kill him, kill him. It would not surprise me if he had a thought. Did it last long? Did it happen? I don't know. I have no idea. But he is human, so it just wouldn't surprise me if he thought, wow, this really would solve all my problems. This would be great. I could stop living in caves. <laughs> you know, I, I could you know, quit worrying about spears coming out of nowhere and jamming into the wall, whatever, right? But he did not, and we, and we, know, we know why he didn't. Um, now, do you think at any point Jonathan, his relationship with Jonathan had an impact on him, on him killing Saul? You think so? In that moment, you think he's thinking, oh man, Jonathan, he'll freak out if I kill his dad. Well, he right? Loves his dad. Hmm? Hmm? He knew that Jonathan loved his dad. Right. Right? So again, it, yeah, it's all conjecture. I have no idea. I'm just throwing out ponderings. I have no idea. No, no stand here. I don't know. But it's interesting to think about because even if he did have a thought about Jonathan, if he did, his response did not include anything about Jonathan. His response was, I will not kill the anointed of the Lord. That's interesting. So even if he did... Um, or didn't have Jonathan in mind, do you realize that because he honored God, the fruit of that was his relationship with Jonathan remained very strong, and there was never a threat to his relationship because he honored God. So that's pretty amazing. So, um, this friendship between Saul and David was very, very one-sided. Um, it appeared as though Saul barely knew David at all. I mean, barely really knew him, knew who he was, and knew that he wanted to kill him, but you know, that's pretty much bullet one and bullet two, we're, we're done. Um, his jealousy and his pride just really got the best of him, and it destroyed what could have been a beautiful, I mean, can you imagine being close to one of your commanders who was going out and, and 
you know, removing the enemy from the country. I mean, how amazing would that relationship have been if Saul would have been able to cut off that root of bitterness and actually have a relationship with David, right? But, but it's all the what ifs. So my point here is, and how we can apply this man who is a, a man after God's own heart, a man that God looks at and says, wow, you act like me. You think like me on some level. You are after my own heart. So, more than David having anxiety about Saul, more than David having a love for Jonathan, more than David seeing the end, the, the huge light at the end of the tunnel at those opportunities to kill Saul and just be done with it, more than any of those life circumstances that you can pull conjecture. I mean, you can think of all kinds of circumstances and things that may have gone through all of these characters' minds. All of those circumstances, anything you come up with, none of them paled. I mean, none of them paralleled David's love for God. And that's the key. That is the key. So, the key to finding, keeping, and being a good friend is to know God. Amen. Understanding his will and his purposes and applying them at all costs. Even Saul, in all of his fury, was twice calmed by the person he was seeking to kill because David said, I could have killed you, but I didn't. And I didn't because God would have been upset with me. The only reason that David was successful is because God equipped him. David wasn't awesome because David was awesome. David was awesome because he listened to God, he knew God, and he made God's opinion mean more than anything else. God anointed Saul, that's it. I am not going to kill him. He can do whatever he wants to me. I will not harm the anointed of God. That's an amazing concept. So, I challenge, I have to read this because I don't want to misspeak my thoughts. And of course, my notes are out of order. All right. So basically, what I'd like you to leave here from this idea of friendship, how to be a good friend, how to maintain a good friendship, how to seek out and find good friends. It's a challenge. I am challenging myself, I'm challenging each of you in this room to not only be friends with the Jonathans of this world or the Davids of this world. Be friends with those people. But don't exclusively be friends with those people. Don't, don't take the easy way. There's so much fruit that comes from easy friends, so much fruit. But there's more fruit to be had. Be a friend to someone who really doesn't pay attention to who you are, doesn't take the time to engage you, doesn't take the time to understand you, maybe even doesn't like you. <coughs> Saul and David were forced into a relationship due to this work that they did together. And maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you all have relationships in your families or at work where you feel like you're in a one-sided relationship or one-sided friendship. But maybe you and I can make God's opinion mean more than anything else. We can become knowers of God. We can want to study his word. We can want to understand his heart. We can drive ourselves to go forward looking for God in everybody, seeing that person through God's eyes, someone that he created, he loves, and he wants with him for all eternity. See that person with God's eyes. It's a challenge, but I'm challenging you to do that. I think, ladies, more than a checklist or a to-do list, 
We just need to make God the center of our lives. He will bring in those people that He wants in our lives, and He will remove those people that He does not want in our lives. And we have to be submissive to that. We have to be okay and say, you are ripping my heart out, but I love you and I trust you. And I will not go against what is anointed of God. Maybe we can love the lovable and the unlovable. And maybe we can have such a close relationship with Jesus that he is all that matters and we just love. Just maybe. Thank you.